Hello viewers, I'm Daniel Kasahun. This is ETV Language. In this edition, we are interested to spend time with the British Ambassador to Ethiopia, Susanna Moorhead, to discuss on women empowerment, the reform in Ethiopia, and foreign policy priorities of the UK in relation to Ethiopia and some other points. Welcome to ABC Studio. Thank you for having me. <laughs> The world has seen over 110 uh, women heads of state and uh, government since 2000. There have been plenty of women presidents and prime ministers so far since 2000. We can mention Margaret Thatcher, Indira Gandhi in the past, and currently we can mention Angela Merkel and Theresa May. They are now in power. Last in the list is in Ethiopia. We find. Uh, uh, Salor Zaudi. She has become the first woman president of Ethiopia recently. What do you comment on her appointment? And also, we have a, Ethiopia has appointed 10 ministers uh, recently. And uh, uh, what are your comments on these appointments? Well, I'd like to offer very warm congratulations to President Salawak. I think it's a uh, an extraordinary achievement to be the first woman uh, president of Ethiopia. Um, you said that we'd had a lot of women heads of state and prime ministers. I think I would push back and say not nearly enough. Uh, historically, uh, it's a job that has been dominated by men, but we are delighted um, at the very strong signal this sends to all Ethiopians about the importance of gender equality. As you rightly said, we at the moment have uh, a woman prime minister in, in Theresa May, and of course Her Majesty the Queen, uh, who is the, the longest serving female head of state in the world. Um, and she did send a private message of congratulations to President Salawak. Um, so good. I guess from, from the longest serving to the newest uh, yeah. woman pr uh, president or head of state. Um, so we, we think this is a very strong signal um, you mentioned the number of women in the cabinet. I think that too shows that Prime Minister Abbey is serious about gender equality and changing uh, the empowerment of women in this country, which is something that both I personally and my government strongly support. Uh, uh, in a nutshell, uh, how do you describe us the reform uh, happening in Ethiopia since last April? I think it would be a, a, a braver person than me who tried to put everything that uh, Prime Minister Abiy has done into a nutshell. Um, he has an enormous, um, very wide-ranging, very far-reaching, uh, very exciting reform agenda, politically, economically, and socially. Uh, and um, you know, I we are um, strong supporters of what he is trying to achieve, <laughs> opening up political space, reforming the economy, uh, promoting the rights of women and girls. Um, but I don't think it's something that can easily be um, uh. crushed into a nutshell. I, I, yeah. What I embrace is, is how broad ranging it is, how ambitious it is, and how potentially transformative it is for, for this country. <laughs> You're also the first uh, female ambassador uh, in the diplomatic line of the UK to Ethiopia. And uh, how's your, your, your country's performance in putting the women to the decision-making uh, position? Well, I think in terms of my own performance, you, you'd have to ask um, your government and my diplomatic colleagues here and in London. Um, but what I would say is, I think it shows that you know we women can do big jobs. Uh, yeah. We don't we don't uh, make any more mistakes than men do. Okay. Um, there, there's a, a phrase that that I like very much, which says the definition of equality is having a woman in the top job doing it badly, mm -hmm. uh, which is another way of saying you know you often have men doing jobs that are above their capability. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it is important to stretch everybody. And I think the more opportunities you give to women uh, in leadership roles, uh, to women um, to be able to set the direction and to be able to work very closely with men, uh, the more you will see societies transform and change. 
um, you know, the, the, there is a huge amount of evidence to show that the most effective teams, whether in politics or diplomacy or business or anywhere else, are those that have a good gender balance, that have a mixture of men and women, uh, because people come with different perceptions, different views, different ways of doing things. So I think what Prime Minister Abiy has done both for the appointment of President Saleh work, but also more generally in putting uh, some women into some very key ministerial posts, uh, shows that he reads the evidence too. Yeah. And uh, I, th I think it's a very powerful team to take forward uh, this, this massive reform agenda. Uh, that's great. But how is the practice of the UK in women empowerment? Well, Can you give us um, a picture? So you could say at the top level, we're not doing badly. We have uh, mm -hmm. a head of state who's a woman mm -hmm. and a prime minister. In terms of our cabinet, we're not doing as well as Ethiopia. About a third of women um, it, uh, are cabinet members. So there's room for some improvement there. Um, but overall, um, you know, there is a strong commitment on the part of my government to improve gender equality. We've taken a huge amount of action recently on trying to close what we call the gender pay gap which is this iniquitous um, situation where women are paid less than men for doing the same job. Uh, so we are, uh, companies over a certain size now have to report the size of their gender pay gap and uh, then mm. make public what steps they're taking to, to close that. So there is always further to go. Um, there are always women's rights uh, that we think we've achieved, that we have to protect. And I think it's quite concerning in some parts of the world where we see uh, women's rights that we thought were locked down are being challenged. But I think uh, it's safe to say that the UK remains at the forefront of protecting women's rights and trying to promote them further. Um, you may not be aware, but this year is the, uh, the 100th anniversary of women first being given the vote in the UK. Okay. It's only 100 years. Oh. And even then, in, uh, in 1918, uh, it was only women aged over 30 who owned property or had been to university. So there were still huge numbers of women who were excluded, mm -hmm. but for the first time we were given the vote. Um, and since then, obviously, we have um, moved steadily to a position of universal suffrage, where every, every woman and man over the age of 18 has the right to vote. Uh, but that is uh, something that we are celebrating with a huge amount of pride in the UK this year. That's great. Uh, you have made tremendous changes uh, in your diplomatic mission here. We know the UK, the Great Britain is keen to support Ethiopia and some other African countries. Uh, in your position, how are you strategizing uh, in order to support the reform happening in this country? I think the first thing to say is that we are um, not just a fair weather friend of Ethiopia. We have um, invested in Ethiopia for many, many years now, um, and it has long been um, one of our largest development programs in the world, um, and indeed the largest in Africa. Uh, so our approach is, is not to make a dramatic change to everything that we've been doing to get girls into school, uh, to improve healthcare systems, to work very closely alongside uh, the Ethiopian government to help achieve, firstly, the Millennium, De sorry, the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, yeah. that's easier, and now the Sustainable Development Goals, the okay. SDGs. Um, but what we have sought to do um, in recent years, and it's something that we're accelerating now with, uh, with Prime Minister Abiy's government, is to focus more on economic development, on job creation, mm -hmm. on supporting um, Prime Minister Abiy Go Abiy's government's uh, economic reform. Um, as we prepare to leave the European Union, we are redoubling our efforts to increase trade with mm -hmm. Ethiopia and other African countries. Uh, so we have a, a, a balance, uh, mm -hmm. a balance, if you like, between what I would regard as, as our our more traditional poverty reduction and human development agenda, mm -hmm. but now increasingly looking forward to Ethiopia, we hope becoming a middle-income country, 
and to providing jobs for the, for the 70 million Ethiopians under the age of 30, mm. which is actually more people than live in the whole UK. I mean, it is a huge, huge number of people, all of whom need and deserve good, decent jobs. Yes, so you are active in girls' education, empowering the women. What has been achieved so far? I think we, you can mention it in figures. Well, so far we, we can um, directly um, count 600,000 girls who were in school as a result of, of financing um, by, the, by the British government, which of course is financing by the British public. Uh, and so I think in terms of girls' enrolment and attendance, that is a huge success. Um, and what's particularly important about that is that, that we have worked through and, and with the Ministry of Education. So everything we try and do is to strengthen Ethiopian systems to improve uh, Ethiopian education. More recently, we have focused particularly on quality. So it's, it's a great thing that children go to school, but unless they are having good learning outcomes, unless they're learning things that's going to help them get jobs, um, the value of, of that, uh, that education is, is not everything that it could be. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we will continue to support the system. We're also very keen to help uh, particularly vulnerable children, children with disabilities, children living in remote areas to go to school as well because mm -hmm. it, it is just, if not more important, for mm -hmm. them to have the, the empowerment that education offers. That's great. Uh, you have this notion the UK relies on a stable Ethiopia that's supportive of uh, UK's uh, foreign policy priorities in the Horn of Africa, particularly in relation to Somalia and South Sudan. Why, why you highlighted on the stability of this country? I mean, I think Ethiopia is um, absolutely key to the stability of the Horn of Africa. Uh, I mean, there, as, as you've mentioned, there are a number of very tra troubled, fragile, conflict-prone states on your, on your borders. Uh, and we are uh, very like-minded with Ethiopia about the need to help peace break out in both Somalia and South Sudan. We are extremely grateful to Ethiopia for it, its huge contribution to peacekeeping both in its immediate neighborhood but more broadly in the world. I think there is a, um, I mean, an extraordinary achievement um, of President Abiy to uh, bring peace to Eritrea. Uh, so we have a, a shared agenda. It is in nobody's interest for the Horn of Africa to be unstable. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the cost to human life, the cost to the economy, the cost to progress is simply mm -hmm. too great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Ethiopia, I say for a long time, has, has been a, a, a beacon of relative stability in, in this part of the world, and that is something that we, we want to see more of. Uh, we are, of course, very conscious that there are, um, there are areas of, of instability and difficulty, um, mm -hmm. and, and you know, we um, support uh, everything that can be done to resolve those political tensions and, and to you know, invest in uh, prime ministers and the governments and I'm sure the, the new president's uh, determination for peace to break out. I mean, I thought uh, President Salewerk's speech to parliament um, where she kept reiterating Salam, it was very, very powerful. Um, yes. And she made it, you know, I think patently clear to anybody who was listening nice. that without peace, uh, it's almost impossible to achieve anything else. Um, it, 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 a former uh, British development minister used to say that uh, conflict was development in reverse. So everything that you're trying to achieve as a country, if there is conflict either within Ethiopia's borders or on the periphery, makes that harder. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what are the shared agendas in uh, uh, peacekeeping missions between Ethiopia and the UK? Well, uh, we invest a huge amount uh, in um, helping to train peacekeepers. So this is uh, British military uh, personnel uh, who will train 
um, Ethiopian and other uh, African peacekeepers uh, in a whole range of skills, everything from, from I mean, the critically important um, uh, skill of how to detect and then uh, demobilize uh, improvised um, explosive devices, so the, these mm. terrible um, bombs that, that are so maiming for soldiers, you know, that you're walking down the road and, and something hidden um, will suddenly blow up a, a, a number of soldiers. So we have a, a, a training center uh, in Nairobi uh, that does that, and we recently brought that course here to Addis Ababa. So to train soldiers how to spot them and then how to get rid of them using, using robots. Actually, it's very, very clever. We do a huge amount of work on um, preventing sexual violence uh, in peacekeeping troops. So training peacekeepers um, how to protect women and children, training them how, how to um, uh, manage their own troops if their own troops start uh, uh, behaving um, in, in an inappropriate way. Uh, we do an awful lot on planning. We do a lot of work on um, uh, teaching uh, good English. I mean, many Ethiopians like yes. you speak extremely good English, yes. but you know, we, will, we will do uh, English language training for, for peacekeepers. So across a whole suite of um, necessary skills for peacekeepers. Um, and then of course we serve alongside uh, you in, in South Sudan and Somalia and elsewhere. Yeah, uh, that's right. In peacekeeping mission, Ethiopia has nice track record. It is well celebrated in peacekeeping missions. But the current situation in Ethiopia is uh, a paradox to that one. How do you think that uh, internally, Ethiopia is now threatened by uh, groups that are conflicting to each other and there are hundreds of thousands of displaced Ethiopians in the country. How do you think that this country can be able to Im take out of this problem? Oof, that's a difficult question. I mm. think, and I think if I had the answer to that, I would, uh, <laughs> might even be in Prime Minister Abiy's cabinet, you never know. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, when a country emerges from a period of instability and unrest, as Ethiopia has done, and where there perhaps has not been as much political space for people with alternative views as, um, as, as one would, would wish. There is bound to be some unrest. Uh, I think that is a, an inevitable consequence of political change. Um, I think it is also true to say that um, there are an awful lot of quite angry, young, and they are mostly men, I have to say. I'm sure there are some women, but they, they seem to be mostly men. Um, who have enormous expectations and who for the past two or three years have um, been encouraged by some to use violence as a means of bringing about political change. And I think those, uh, those groups are still waiting. They, they've had a political answer and they have greater uh, political freedom, but they are still waiting I think to feel materially better off. So this brings me back to the, the point I made about jobs. Um, you know, they, they, they need to benefit from the economic reforms that Prime Minister Abiy has talked of so that they can feed their families, so that they can feel that they have something left in their pockets at the end of the day or at the end of the week, at the end of the month. And I think the, the, the transition, possibly the transformation that Ethiopia is going through is bound to uh, have pockets of unrest. Um, and much like uh, Prime Minister Abiy has said, it, it is really an appeal, I think, to all those uh, frustrated people to, to work with him, to work with President Salo work in order to make the reform process smoother. Uh, because as you say, if, if, if that doesn't happen, you do get these uh, really tragic um, episodes of, of internal displacement and unrest, and one of the, I think one of the um, most distressing things about this year is that, you know, Ethiopia has actually had a very very good harvest in most of the country, mm -hmm. um, 
given how many people depend on, on rain-fed agriculture and pastoralism here for a living, when you get a good year, you really need to bank that mm -hmm. and let people accumulate their assets, save, build up their herds, build up um, their reserves. And in, in many parts of the country where there has been um, often local unrest, that has created a different sort of humanitarian crisis mm -hmm. that has meant that it hasn't been possible to, to bank that year. Um, so, you know, look, there are no, there are no easy answers to this, uh, but I, I firmly believe that uh, if Prime Minister Abbey is able to uh, press ahead with his economic reforms, which are not easy, I mean, there are no, there are no quick wins. I mean, if, they, if, there, if there were a silver bullet to solve this problem, I'm sure he would have found it by now. But this is a, a, a complex process, but it is... Um, essential to press ahead with it and, and to align that with um, the benefits of political reform that people are already feeling. But with political reform comes, comes opposition. I mean, it, it, it's, um, you know, look at, look at the um, daily pasting that my government gets in the British press. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what a free press means. It means that um, your leaders are, are held to account on a on an hourly basis. Oh, that's great. Uh, what's your final message to the government and the people of Ethiopia in their stride to succeed in the reform happening in this country? Um, I think it is a message of um, good luck, mm -hmm. um, resilience, stick with it, because it, 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 it's, uh, I think it's a marathon, not a sprint, but don't give up. Um, and Ethiopians are world leaders in marathons. Uh, so um, I have no doubt that Ethiopia will stay the course and my government, my embassy, um, stand ready to help in any way we can. Thank you very much, Ambassador Thank you. Susanna Morhead. Thank you for your time. Well, there will be words that wraps up the program in this edition. Many thanks for joining us. See you next time with yet another edition of the program on Current Affairs. Till then, goodbye.